so using our theorem, this is the plot. There's a gapped region and a gapless region, uh, which are shown in the plot. Um, you know, you can compute, for example, the phase boundary at some curve. Uh, but what's going to be important for illustrating the proof later on is only that this is some two-parameter family of states and that we can plot things. So that's all I, I would like you to remember. Okay. So that now brings me to the proof sketch, which I promise will be fun. Yes? That seems a little surprising because things have to be equal for it to be gapless, so that seems like it should be kind of a lower measure of steps. That's true, um, I believe, in the state space of all two qubit states. So the, in some sense, this example is a bit special. Um, yeah, if you took another cut through this set of states that had two parameters, I think this would not be true. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah, as I was saying, like the proof sketch, I, I promise will be uh, at least a little bit fun. Um, and so the fun starts now with uh, continued fractions. Now this, this is an aside, but um, it's meant to wake people up. And uh, you know, I know that most people are familiar with continued fractions, maybe in the context of Shor's algorithm, but there's really only one fact that we're going to care about that comes out of the continued fractions expansion. And so this is how I want you to think about it for the, for the rest of this talk. Okay, so this is the real line. And uh, I want to imagine a sequence of grids. So for every positive integer, we're going to define a grid, where the grid marks are the rational numbers with denominator n. So for example, if n is 2, the grid marks would be like minus 1 half, 0, 1 half, 3 halves, et cetera. So, but I'm viewing this as a sequence of grids, one for each positive integer. OK? Now it's obvious that if you care about some irrational number alpha, say, on the real line, it is approximated by the nearest grid point to within 1 over n, because the grid points are 1 over n apart. What is less obvious, but which follows from the continued fractions expansion of an irrational number alpha, is that if we fix, so we, we're going to fix our attention on some irrational number alpha, then what we can do is we can choose a subsequence of these grids, such that for every member of that subsequence, you're within 1 over n squared of the nearest grid point. And so how does this relate to continued fractions? The, the subsequence that you choose, the n sub j, those are the denominators in the convergence of the continued fractions expansion for alpha. They, they satisfy this property. Are there any questions about that? OK. So the point is that we have a sequence of grids. They're 1 over n apart, so you're always within 1 over n. If you take a subsequence that depends on the point you care about, you can make sure you're within 1 over n squared. That's what's going to matter. OK. So now I'm going to talk about how we prove the first part of the theorem. So I'm going to consider the case where the eigenvalues have equal non-zero absolute value. And our goal is to show that the spectral gap of the Hamiltonian is at most 1 over n minus 1. OK. Now the proof is going to use a relationship between uh, the Hamiltonian that we started with, which I'm going to call the open boundary chain, or the, the, the Hamiltonian with the open boundary conditions. And so here I've written down the Hamiltonian that we've already talked about, as well as notation for its spectral gap. So this is what I'm going to write for its spectral gap. Um, and I've also written down uh, another Hamiltonian, which has a superscript P for periodic boundary condition. And this Hamiltonian, you just take the open boundary chain and add an extra term, which uh, acts between the nth and the first qubit. So this is a truly translation invariant system on a ring. And again, I'm just defining notation for its spectral gap. We're going to use a superscript P to denote periodic boundary condition. Okay, so this so far is just notation. But what's kind of amazing is that the spectral gaps of these chains, the open boundary and the periodic boundary chain, are related. Now, I don't want you to parse this equation right now, but this is um, what I want you to observe is that um, there are two integers, m and n. m is larger than n. And on the left-hand side, we have the gap of the Hamiltonian for the periodic boundary chain uh, of size m. But on the right-hand side, everything depends on n. Okay? So that's what I want you to notice right now. Now, I want to imagine fixing n. I'm going to fix n. So the right-hand side is just some fixed value of n. And then I'm going to take m. I want to imagine taking m to infinity um, maybe I'll take it along a subsequence of positive integers, okay? Now, let's suppose or imagine that the, the periodic chain is gapless and that its gap goes to zero along the subsequence that I'm considering. Well, then the right, left-hand side is, is 
in this lemma is going to zero. We can take it to zero because m and n uh, are just arbitrary. But the right-hand side, we fixed n, so it's just the same. So we have zero is greater than or equal to the right-hand side. And so what that shows is that the, uh, the gap of the open boundary chain then is upper bounded by 1 over n minus 1 if we can show that the periodic chain is gapless, or at least that its gap goes to zero along a subsequence of positive integers. OK. So what this says is that if we want to show that the gap of the open boundary chain is at most 1 over n minus 1 for every n, it is sufficient to show that the periodic chain is gapless. And of course, this is, we want to show this in the case where the eigenvalues of t have equal non-zero magnitude. OK. So we've reduced the problem to showing that the periodic chain is gapless. And so how do we do that? Well, we are going to use a fact about the ground space degeneracy of the periodic chain along with this uh, continued fractions fact that I mentioned earlier. So let me now first talk about the ground space degeneracy of the periodic chain. We already discussed the ground state degeneracy of the open boundary chain, which we said was almost always n plus 1. For the periodic chain, the chain with periodic boundary conditions, that's not true. In the case where psi is entangled, the ground state degeneracy of the periodic chain is n plus 1 only if this funny condition holds that t raised to the nth power is proportional to the identity. Otherwise, which is most of the time, this ground state degeneracy is 2. So this periodic chain has funny behavior. Ground state degeneracy most of the time is 2, but there are these uh, places where the t matrix raised to the nth power is proportional to the identity, and then there's more ground states. Okay. So now I just want to focus on the third eigenvalue of the periodic chain. Okay? So I'm just going to write the, just to establish notation, I'm just going to write the eigenvalues in increasing order as lambda sub j of psi and n. These are the eigenvalues of the periodic chain. And I want to focus on the third one. And I'm just going to draw out of this lemma one fact about that third eigenvalue. Okay? So the fact is that the third, you know, if this condition holds that t raised to the nth power is proportional to the identity, then the lemma says there are n plus 1, 0 eigenvalues. I mean, we already said this is uh, uh, frustration free, so there are n plus 1, 0 eigenvalues. And so in particular, the third eigenvalue is 0 if t raised to the nth power is proportional to the identity. But if, if that condition doesn't hold, then there are two 0 eigenvalues, and the third eigenvalue is the spectral gap. So this third eigenvalue is now the thing that I want to talk about, which is sometimes 0 and sometimes the spectral gap. And I want to consider when is it 0 and when is it the spectral gap as a function of psi. So I want to fix n and plot the curves where this, uh, where this third eigenvalue is 0. Okay, so, and, and so um, it's going to help to visualize this. And so now, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to specialize to the two-parameter family of states that we talked about earlier in example 3. Okay. So, so just to remind you, some two-parameter family of states. Um, this plot, um, what's important to remember is that each point in this plot is some two-qubit state psi. And our goal is to show that the periodic chain is gapless in the blue region, because that's the region where the eigenvalues of t have the same magnitude. Okay. And what we showed on the previous slide is that the third eigenvalue of the periodic chain is 0 if this condition holds, and otherwise it's the spectral gap. And now I'm going to plot the curves where it's 0. And to do that, I'm going to fix n, because the condition depends on n. So I'm going to fix n to be 10. So the black curves are where the third eigenvalue is 0. And everywhere else in the plot, the third eigenvalue is the spectral gap. OK, so this is for n equals 10. But now I could in increase n. And uh, this is for n equals 50. And now, well, we can observe some properties of what seems to be happening. So one thing that seems to be happening is that there's more curves, and they get closer together. But the other thing is that the curves are excluded completely from the red region. Um, and that, you can prove, holds quite generally. So the black curves, as n becomes large, uh, become dense in the blue region and are excluded from the red region. So let's just think about this for a second. We have a function defined in this two-parameter uh, space. And the function takes the value 0 on each of these black curves, which are becoming dense. 
But everywhere else, the function is the spectral gap. And we want to show the spectral gap is going to zero if you're sitting in this blue region. So you might think, well, if you're close enough to a black curve, then the spectral gap should be close to zero. Because on the black curve, this function, which is equal to the spectral gap um, in the blue region, uh, is, takes the value zero on the, on the black curve. Okay. So that's sort of the, the logic, that the function is continuous. It takes the value 0 on the black curves. It's equal to the spectral gap everywhere else. And so if there's some point that we care about, like psi blue in the blue region, if it's close enough to the nearest black point, then the gap must be small because this function is continuous. But of course, to evaluate how close does it need to be, we need to look at the derivative of this function as a function of psi. Um, so I'm just going to do one line of, of math. The, uh, the gap, if we're focused on some point in the blue region, uh, the gap of the periodic chain is just equal to the third eigenvalue. And here I've just subtracted off the third eigenvalue of uh, the Hamiltonian at the nearest black point, which is 0. So I've just subtracted off 0. But now this is the difference between the third eigenvalue of two Hamiltonians, uh, which can be bounded using um, a rigorous version of perturbation theory called Viles inequality. And the bound that we obtain you get a factor of 2n, just arising from the number of terms in the Hamiltonian. And you get a factor which is uh, the, the norm of the difference between the blue state and the nearest state on a black curve. And so the question is, we know that that norm is going to 0, because the black curves are becoming dense in the blue region. But does it, does it go to 0 fast enough to kill that factor of n out front? And the answer, well, the bad news is that it doesn't. The black curves are becoming dense, but um, this, this difference, uh, the norm of the difference between psi blue and phi black uh, can go like 1 over n. And so um, this argument is not strong enough to show that, that, um, that the gap is going to 0 as n goes to infinity. But of course, now here's where we invoke uh, continued fractions. Because this really, this situation is completely analogous to the situation that we talked about earlier, where we had a sequence of grids. And you're focused on some irrational number. And you know, the, the grid is becoming more fine, so you're always within 1 over n of the nearest grid point. And what helped there is that instead of just looking at the sequence of grids and the difference um, between the nearest grid points, the distance between the nearest grid points, what you should do is you should choose a subsequence of the grids that depends on the number that you care about. And it's exactly the same thing that works here. And in fact, it really is just a straightforward application of continued fractions and the functional form of the curves themselves. So what, what we do is we choose a subsequence of these uh, values of n, such, which depends on the point that you care about. So you fix some state psi in the blue region, choose a subsequence of values of n, and along that subsequence, using con <coughs> continued fractions, one can show that this norm difference goes like 1 over n squared. And that's good enough to, to get us that the periodic chain goes, the gap goes to 0 along that subsequence, which then, via this Knabe's lemma, tells us that you have an upper bound of 1 over n minus 1 on the gap of the open boundary chain. OK, so let me now mention a couple of fine points. One is that uh, this technique has to be modified a little bit to handle the states which correspond to points which lie directly on one of the black curves. And the second thing is just that you know, for the purposes of this talk, I specialized to this two-parameter family so we could plot these curves and show you visually what was going on. But the proof in our paper handles arbitrary state psi. OK. So that now brings me to the second part of the theorem. So in the second part, what we aim to show is that if the eigenvalues of t are either both 0 or have distinct complex absolute value, then the spectral gap is lower bounded by a positive constant independent of n. Now let me just say that the first case where both eigenvalues of t are 0 is trivial because in that case, the terms in the Hamiltonian commute with one another and the spectral gap is 1. So, um, so in the following, I'm going to only talk about the case where the eigenvalues have distinct magnitudes. One of them could be 0, but not both. OK. So there is a general method for proving lower bounds on eigenvalue gaps for 1D frustration-free systems which is due to Bruno Nachtigal and is sometimes called the Martingale method. And the way that that method works is as follows. You have your n qubit chain. And what you are told to do is to partition it into three regions, a, b, and c. c is just one qubit on the end of the chain. 
B has some size r, which you should think of as a large constant. And A is everything else, so in particular, the size of A is scaling with n. Okay. And now the, we're going to have to think about these three projectors. The first one, GABC, is the projector onto the ground space of the Hamiltonian for the full chain. GAB is the projector onto the ground space of AB tensored with the identity on region C. And likewise, GBC is the projector onto the ground space of BC tensored with the identity on region A. And so what Nachtigall says, specialized to our case, is the following. He says, suppose, let's just look at this, uh, this, this formula here, this displayed formula. Um, it says if you can show that the, the ground space projector GABC is well approximated by GAB times GBC, then the system is gapped. And what does well approximated mean? Well, it means that there is some constant system, uh, overlap size. So I say overlap because here are GAB and GBC overlap in region B, which is of size R. So R is a constant, and epsilon, the um, quality of the approximation, has to be less than 1 over square root R plus 1. And this has to hold for all sufficiently large n. Now, so if you can show this condition, then you can show that the Hamiltonian is gapped via this Nachtigall theorem. Um, so I'm now going to state what it is that we prove, how, how exactly this condition is satisfied in our case. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, to do that, I just need to define two things. One is the ratio of the eigenvalues of t. And I'm choosing the largest divided by the smallest. So that ratio is between 1 and uh, infinity. And I'm also going to define the inner product between the eigenvectors, which is, uh, has absolute value less than 1. And here's the theorem that we proved. So if you partition the qubits for our system into consecutive regions A, B, and C with some size where B has size R, then uh, this quantity, the, the norm of GABC minus GAB times GBC, uh, decreases exponentially in R, the overlap region size. And since it decreases exponentially in R, it's at least as good as 1 over square root R, which is what you needed for Nachtigall's condition. So in particular, applying Nachtigall's theorem, we get that the Hamiltonian is gapped when the eigenvalues of T have distinct magnitudes. OK, but uh, what I haven't told you is how do we prove this? And actually, that is the technical sort of meat of our paper. And the reason for that is because the reason why it, it's sort of technically challenging is because we don't have explicit expressions for any of the quantities on the left-hand side. So I mentioned earlier that we know the ground space, but we cannot compute or don't know how to compute an orthonormal basis. And so what that means is that we cannot write down an expression for the ground space projector on ABC, on AB, or on BC. So we don't have expressions for any of those quantities, which makes this uh, technically challenging. Um, right. So in the, in the last few minutes of the talk, I'm just going to mention some of the elements of the proof, but I won't really go into great detail because it is uh, technical. Um, the, uh, I would say the, the key ingredient in the proof is the following operator inequality, which holds for the ground space projector of these chains, which was um, maybe surprising to us, at least. Uh, so the, the operator inequality says the, other, the, the following thing. It says that if you take the ground space projector on n spins, the full ground space projector, and trace out the last spin, so now you have an operator on n, n minus 1 spin, that as an operator is greater than or equal to the ground space projector on n minus 1 spins. Now, um, let me just mention that this operator inequality, which we call monotonicity under the partial trace, seems to be, well, certainly it's more general than what we require for our theorem. In particular, our proof that we give in our paper applies to qubit chains composed of rank 1 projectors even without translation invariance. And um, we don't know how generally or how generally it holds, so it could hold even in more general scenarios as far as we know. Okay, but um, how is it useful? One way in which it's useful is that it directly implies that certain expectation values form non-decreasing sequences. So like, for example, if you take some operator q, which is positive semi-definite, and acts on, say, the first k qubits, where k is a constant, and now form this expectation value, the trace of q against the ground space, then it follows from this monotonicity that that is a non-decreasing sequence. Um, OK. OK, so now I'm just going to uh, very briefly sketch the sort of 
things that we show which lead us to this um, theorem which is sufficient for an actual condition. Essentially, our strategy is to apply the frustration freeness condition and monotonicity under the partial trace to build up a sequence of identities <coughs> held by the ground space projector up to small errors, uh, with the final one being this Nactrigel condition. Um, so, okay, so just to write down some things, I'm going to need to define alpha and beta to be the eigenvectors of this T matrix. So the first thing we do is we consider some correlation functions in, in the ground space. So here are two correlation functions, a one-point function and a two-point function. We prove that one of them decays exponentially and the other one approaches a finite limit. We use monotonicity under the partial trace here. And um, from the correlation functions, we then uh, prove more complicated identities which involve excluding a region from some partition of the chain. So like here is one example. You have a partition ABC. Here, we call it a region exclusion identity because you have GABC, but then you're subtracting something where region C has been excluded. You have GAB tensor identity on C. I'm not, as I said, going to go into the details of how uh, these are proved, or even how the claimed bound on the norm of GABC minus GAB, GBC follows, but it follows from the three region exclusion identities that we prove in our paper. Okay. Um, so now I will end with some open questions. So I think one of the most interesting open questions is as follows. There is an infinite family of frustration-free models in one dimension on qubits. So we considered qubits. But there is a generalization to qubits, which is as follows. So now we consider Hilbert space of qubits of local dimension d. And a Hamiltonian, which is just, you, you know, you choose some rank r projector, pi, acting on two qubits. And you define an open boundary chain, which is translation invariant. So here's the Hamiltonian. So we have two parameters, r and d, the rank of the projector and the local dimension d of the qubits. And what's interesting is that um, it was shown by Movasa et al. that this generic case that we saw for qubits, where they're rank one, uh, holds more generally when the rank is less than or equal to d squared over four. So the generic interesting case we, we solved generalizes to qubits in this way whenever the rank is at most d squared over four. So like obviously when d is two for qubits, the only generic case here where it's frustration free, where it's guaranteed to be frustration free is where the rank is one and that's the case that we talked about for the last 30 minutes. Um, but there is this vast generalization. And in their paper they also argue, or they give, I should say, um, they give some evidence that the, the system is frustrated when r is larger than d squared over four. So then of course it's a natural question to you know, whether or not we can generalize our results to these qubit models where uh, d is larger than 2. Um, OK, so now I have three sort of smaller questions. Uh, the first is, how general is this operator inequality, uh, monotonicity under the partial trace? Does it hold, for example, for these qubit models? Um, I think a very challenging but also interesting question is what can be said about frustrated systems. Um, for frustrated systems, we don't even have any methods that I know of to bound spectral gaps. Um, so neither the Knabe method or the Nachtigall method works for frustrated systems, and I don't know of any others. Along those lines, but only tangentially related, I think it's an interesting question whether or not it is possible to certify that a given one-dimensional chain is gapped in the thermodynamic limit only by looking at data from finite size numerics. So like, one thing I did not discuss in this talk, but which follows from Knabe's lemma, is that it is possible to certify that a frustration-free system is gapped using that lemma, just looking at the gap for finite system sizes. If you find that the gap is bigger than, uh, well, some threshold, like Actually, it turns out that the threshold in Kanabi's lemma is not optimal and that it has been improved. But it turns out that if you can show that the gap of an open boundary chain is at least or larger than 6 over n squared, then the gap of the periodic chain uh, is lower bounded by a constant in the limit. So um, I'm sorry for that uh, rambling explanation. But the point is that for frustration-free chains, it's possible to look at the gap of some finite system size n and conclude only from that data point that it's gapped in the thermodynamic limit. And so. I would like to know whether or not that's true also for frustrated systems. 
like can you generalize this Knabe's lemma, for example? Um, okay, I'll end there. Thank you. Are there any questions for David?